Uh, it is now one o'clock, so I welcome everybody to the April 26th uh, Catholic Regional District Board meeting. And I want to recognize that we're holding this meeting on the traditional territory of the Tahama Nation. We have an agenda in front of us. Uh, the corporate officer has suggested that we move item, what was that, 14.1? Yeah, reports to right under delegations and inquiry um, to have uh, Corey Vanderhoort from MNP so that they're considered close together. Mm -hmm. Are there any objections to making that move? So then Corey, you know, I'll next. move the amendment. Okay, thank you. Or seconder. Thanks, uh, Director Hollow. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Okay, great. We'll change that. Any other suggested changes to the agenda? If not, can I get somebody to move to approval of the agenda? Director Gisborne, thank you. Seconded by Director Adamson, alternate Director Adamson. Any discussion? All in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. Great. Adoption of the minutes of the March 22nd, 2023 board meeting. Are there any or errors or omissions? Seeing none, we have a motion to adopt the minutes. Director Doubt, Director Elliott, thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to delegations and inquiries. We have Dan Buckland from the Green Waste Company regarding the application for OCP bylaw amendment for compost facility in electoral area A. Welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, so as well, when I was in the planning committee meeting, I'm really just here to answer any questions on the application or on the project. Also any questions that you may have from the document I submitted just to kind of answer some of the public's concern there. I also just wanted to inform the board as well, the odor management plan has been done already and signed off, but we just missed the window to get it in for the meeting. Uh, the fire prevention plan is also underway. There are requirements from the province as well. So we were gonna have to do them regardless. Okay, um, thanks very much. Can I open it up to, I'll open it up to the board. Any, any questions? Thank you. Um, <laughs> as um, I'm sure you're aware, the concerns from the public and you know, sometimes they're asking us, and it's like it's not us. You got to ask the company. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to thank you for uh, submitting this document. And you know, fire prevention plan, odor management plan, uh, as I am aware, the province requires these kind of things. Yeah. But uh, for us, like we're not the province; we're our own separate thing. So just wanted to say thank you for continuing the work and submitting the paperwork that's been asked. Oh, thank you. That's it. Okay. Any other questions from Director Alternate Director Adamson? Hi. Um, yeah, my question is just around the, I, I went and looked at the website for the Green Mountain Technologies, yeah. and most of the pictures that they had anyway, from what I could see, they were still doing a lot of composting outside. Yeah, that's not what we do. So, so you're proposing all inside all the building. Inside, absolutely, yeah. And so I'm just trying to imagine how big this building is going to be that's big enough that you can have multiple piles at a time and a bulldozer moving around in there. And yeah, so it's uh, 120 long by 60 feet wide. And so within that, we've got sufficient space to be, we're only gonna be using skid steer equipment. So it's, you know, it's the volumes are not that large. Um, obviously, every time someone thinks of compost and they think of the giant facilities that are out there, but this is a very small one. In fact, everyone that we've spoken to normally say, this is the smallest that they've ever designed, or this is the smallest that they've ever So uh, there's more than sufficient space in there. I did, I do have an interior drawing as well, which I realized I didn't actually submit to this, but, uh, that's probably some worthwhile information to get out to you guys as well, just so you can see kind of what it looks like. Um, but yeah, the, the space is, again, it's been designed by Green Mountain Technologies. They've got 30 years of experience and, and they're confident that this is going to be sufficient for what we need. And so, um, and just from my understanding, sorry, I don't know this already, you'll be taking the, the waste, um, uh, if this proposal goes through, from the new Waste Recovery Centre. Mm -hmm. Um, but what about all of the green waste that goes to Augusta, like just for tre uh, trees and yard waste and that sort of stuff? Uh, at this time, we, we, we're not sure if they're going to continue or what the plan is. Our goal is basically to make sure that the new resource recovery center is people's kind of main focus. Um, that kind of makes the most sense that it's the most efficient way for everyone to go. Nobody's making single trips. They can go and do everything they need to do in one trip. Um, so with regards to Augusta, we haven't really discussed, they, they haven't approached us either. So we, we're 
just leaving it until we figure out what their plan is. Okay, but would your new facility have the capacity to take both? Yeah, yeah. So we've the, the fact that we factored in, you know, the estimates have been factored in for 100% participation from everyone. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, Director Elliott. Thank you. So I, I don't see like a site plan diagram or anything like that. So I was wondering if we if we're there yet or how we see how it works with the rest of the resource recovery center. Yeah. Um, so it's not on the same site, obviously. Um, oh, okay. It's it's out out of the uh, city. The site we're going to is on Duck Lake Road. Oh, okay, that's yeah. what's missing. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I didn't realize the. Um, so I submitted the site plan. Planning committee, I believe, but it, it is out there. I'm not on the plan. Uh, okay, I didn't realize I didn't. Plan. <laughs> sorry about that. I, I have this that was attached to the agenda. Oh, is there something out? Oh, okay, it's right. actually on. Sorry to jump in. Yeah, no, on no. Thirty-nine to forty-seven of our agenda. Oh, okay, so I was just looking at the delegation report. Okay, that's. <laughs> right. I was trying to figure out where all that other information was. Yeah, the other information is from the sorry chair, uh, the chair. That's mm -hmm. from our planning committee, and it's on our agenda on page 39 through 47, uh, the information that uh, came from the planning committee. Okay. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I just want to remind, especially the alternate directors, is that generally questions or comments to staff or other board members or delegations are directed through the chair. Uh, Director Dowd, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to comment that uh, it's good to see your, basically your response to questions that were asked at the planning committee. And uh, I think you've done a thorough job of answering a lot of those. So I appreciated seeing your response. I didn't actually expect to see one having been to the client planning committee meeting. I didn't expect to see your response actually to the board that quickly. But uh, I appreciate the information. I think it's quite thorough. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I didn't actually get to see that those questions at the meeting. I wasn't aware that they were submitted. I, I could have probably answered them there as well, but it's probably nice to have it on paper anyway. Okay, seeing no other hands up, I'll say thank you very much for joining us today, and we uh, appreciate the information you included in your delegation report. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. We are moving on to the second delegation, back to Corey Vanderhorst. For those of you who weren't tuning in, he was here for the Regional Hospital District meeting, so welcome back, Vanderhorst. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's get my presentation loaded up here. So you can see that. So, uh, yep, thank you for um, inviting me here to, to speak to you today. Um, I'm hoping everybody can see the first slide with a coffee cup on it. Uh, I'll take you through uh, a little bit of highlights of the financial statements. I'll talk a little bit about the audit process. Um, and uh, I, I want to start off with saying a big thank you to Linda uh, and Jason um, and, and the rest of the staff at the Region District that, that help us with the audit. It goes very smoothly. So, well, as I mentioned, we'll start with the financial statements and then talk about some, some audit process. So a reminder that these are your financial statements, uh, a representation of um, the Region District's results for, for 2022. We'll start with the statement of financial position, uh, what we used to call the balance sheet. Um, and so this, here's a snapshot of the uh, what was in the accounts at the end of December 31st, 2022. The regional district had uh, cash and investment balances of uh, 19.9 million, so uh, a $2 million increase in cash and investments uh, year over year. Um, when you add in the cash, the receivables, and the uh, debt receivable from member municipalities, you get a total financial asset balance of $49.5 million. The regional district carries its own debt of, of $2.3 million, uh, and the total liabilities, debt, accounts payable, and member municipality debt is $41.4 million. So if you subtract the 41.4 from the 49.5, you get what we call the net financial asset position or, or the, the liquid position. And that is $8.1 million at the end of 2022. Again, a very consistent with the prior years, uh, 7,995,000. The tangible capital assets being managed uh, by the regional district have increased from uh, $21.9 million to $25 million. Uh, and the accumulated surplus uh, has also increased from $30 million to $33.6. I will get into the accumulated surplus number in a, a future slide. On the uh, statement of operations, so the results for the year uh, for the regional district, total revenues were $14.5 million. 
uh, up from 13.4 in the prior year. Uh, total expenses of $11 million, up a little bit from the, the 10 and a half in 2021. But again, both revenues and expenses below the budget. Uh, and so important that expenses coming in below budget is uh, an indicator of, of, of cost control and uh, that you're not going over budget there. On an accounting basis, we have an annual surplus of uh, $3.5 million, which is very close to the, the budgeted surplus. Now I say accounting surplus because uh, accounts, we put lots of adjustments and things in there for um, deferred revenues and other things like that. So to unwind that, we look next at the cash flow statement uh, and uh, uh, what actually happened in the main bank accounts at your regional district this year. So for 2022, operations had a net cash inflow of $4.3 million. It's about $500,000 more than the prior year. Uh, capital spending of, of uh, over $4 million. So it's gonna increase from the 2.2 of spending in 2021. Uh, new debt coming in. So uh, this is net of your, your scheduled repayments, um, but a net increase of $1.6 million in, in debt. Uh, and at the end of the year, a net cash inflow of 2,021,503. The accumulated surplus number of, of $33.6 million. The biggest number there at the top is $21.2 million of what we call invested in tangible capital assets. So that's the book value of the assets that we saw on the first slide minus the debt. And it is not a cash balance. It's, it's the um, water, sewer, buildings, equipment, uh, everything that the region district is managing. Um, minus the debt balance. The waste management reserve has 715,000 in it. You can see a, a decrease year over year for some spending um, in 2022. Reserve for future expenditures. So there's a up from 4,495 to $5.3 million. That's money set aside for specific projects and, and future costs. Statutory reserve funds have also increased from 4.5 to $5.6 million. And the function balances or the, the, the overall remainder um, has, has a small increase to 736,273. Shifting gears then out of the financial statements into the, the audit and the audit process, uh, we're happy to be providing what we call an unqualified opinion uh, for the get that regional district this year. That's, that's uh, audit language for a clean audit opinion. We are satisfied that the financial statements that, that you have in front of you in your package are uh, prepared uh, appropriately in all material respects uh, in accordance with uh, the local government accounting standards. Ready to sign our audit report and, and, uh, and get everything to be ready to ship off to the ministry. The last step is uh, approval here today. When we do our audit, uh, a couple reminders of, of the audit process. Um, we do look at controls. That you, that you have in place, uh, internal controls to ensure you're getting accurate reporting of financial results, that, you're, that assets are being safeguarded appropriately. We sample transactions throughout the year to form our audit opinion. We don't look at every transaction. We're just getting enough uh, transactions looked at to be comfortable that, that your statements are accurate. And again, a, a big thank you to uh, management and staff at the regional district for helping us with the audit process. The second bullet on this slide, materiality, is an important number to our audit process. So we calculate this as roughly 4% of, of your annual revenues that you've received. So $550,000 for 2022. Uh, what this means in our audit process is we're looking at every transaction that's larger than that amount. So there we're talking large capital projects or grants coming in. And below that dollar amount, we sample transactions to get comfort over the numbers. If we found something that we disagreed with staff on um, and it was larger than $550,000, I wouldn't be able to give you a clean audit opinion. So any, any unadjusted items need to be below that threshold. Uh, there was no limitations placed on the performance of our audit. We had access to, to all the documents we wanted to see and all the people we want to talk to. Didn't find any unusual transactions or any irregularities. Um, I will clarify, we're, we're not specifically looking for fraud or, or unusual transactions, but if something comes to our attention in the course of the audit, we are required to report it to the board. I do confirm our independence. Uh, we didn't do any other projects or work with the regional district uh, from you know, January 1st, 2022, all the way through to today. Um, that would impair my ability to give you an independent audit opinion. 
Uh, and I'll wrap up by going back into the numbers. Uh, you know, I started looking just at 2022. Uh, we'll uh, look at uh, the next two slides here of uh, trends over the last five years. So we, we start with sustainability, um, where we're looking at the financial assets and comparing to the liabilities, so sort of the liquid position of the regional district. There is a magic number for this ratio of one. If you're below one, it means you are uh, raising taxes or user fees in the future to pay for past transactions. If you're above one, you have some funds put aside for, for future costs and future projects. So for 2022, that ratio is 1.2. It's consistent with the past five years. It, it's actually been um, up and down between 1.23 and 1.2. So holding steady there. The next one we look at is what we call a flexibility ratio. So here we're looking at a rough aging of the infrastructure and the capital assets that you're managing. We compare the depreciated cost to the original cost. Then the carrying value again here is holding steady at 71%. We saw some additional capital spending throughout the year over and above 2021. Um, it's keeping this ratio pretty consistent at that 71% mark. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to my presentation. I'll turn the sharing off and I'd be happy to answer any questions about the financial statements or the audit, audit process. Great, thanks very much, Mr. Vanderhorst. Do we have any questions from the board? Oh, sorry, thank you, Director Paul. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just one question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vanderhorst, for the presentation and, and the audit. I uh, just had one question regarding uh, surpluses. In your presentation, you mentioned, of course, surpluses good because deficits are bad but but what is a good level of surplus because obviously too much surplus represents uh you know something else you know maybe inappropriate taxation so is there a guidance on what level of surplus makes sense i mean greater than zero but is there you know a little bit more or a lot more when's too much uh, thank you director fall a uh, good question uh, there's no magic number um obviously if the surpluses are, are, are really big it, it can be problematic one of the things that that um because uh, I, I can't stress that it was an accounting surplus. Uh, you know, one of the things you can see is if you get a lot of grant funding for capital projects that can skew the surplus number up, the overall surplus number, the accumulated surplus that I went through, one of the important things there is to think about the long range planning that, that you were doing and the staff are doing, the, the asset replacement that you know is coming up. The amount of surplus you're carrying, the amount of reserves um, and what the right number is will depend on what some of those big projects are. Um, you want to have the right mix of, of uh, reserves available. You don't want to be reliant on federal government if, if you need to do very important projects for the community. Um, and and then you always have to have that balancing act of debt versus other funding. So um, the answer of course is there's no right number. Um, your That ratio I did on, on um, financial assets to liabilities at about 1.2 means there is some, some funding put aside for future projects. The other way to look at it as well, um, and I didn't put this ratio up, is if, if you compare your reserve balances to your capital asset balances and calculate a percentage there, it's probably fairly low, five to 10% would be my guess. Um, and that tells you that if you had to go and replace things, that there you wouldn't be able to do a wholesale replacement with what you have. So you'd have to look for future funding or, or future finances. Um, the other important thing about that tangible capital asset number that I mentioned is that's historic cost. It's not the replacement cost. Uh, we know, you know, if you needed to change a water system or replace it, <laughs> that the cost would be a lot higher than what you have it on your books. If you think of something that was built in the, you know, mid eighties, it costs a lot more right now to replace it. So those are all kind of things to factor into that conversation of what's the right surplus level. Um, and every community will have different needs uh, as you look to that long range planning. You know, there might be something three years out or 20 years out, and it's it's having that long range look to when do we need the significant funding uh, is the important piece there. Okay, thank you. And of course, these these reserves and surpluses are partitioned into silos of the regional services. So some services are going to be better than others, or you know, the, yeah. the ratios will vary between services. That's true. Yeah, the function of the regional district is is the the individual pots of money are different depending on the areas for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, you're very welcome. Director Dowd had a question. Yeah, Chair, sure. thank you. I've got uh, two questions for the auditors. The first one is uh, your slides under in your report about sustainability or, you know, in encouraging. 
and uh, reminds me that what we're talking about is the assets over liabilities in 2022. And uh, I think that it says there is room to add additional debt without getting into serious trouble as long as we keep those things uh, in mind in 2023. And what I'm thinking about is we've got significant debt coming online from the Resource Recovery Center of about $6 million, but not part of the audited financial statement, but I think the sustainability comments that you've made indicate that there is room to add additional debt and still stay in uh, a good uh, light you know, sustainability ones. Am I correct about that? Uh, yeah, thank you, Director Doubt. Um, it's, yeah, the, the amount of debt that you can take and, and, and saying, it'd be interesting to see where you land at the end of 2023 in that net, that whether you shift into a net debt position. Um, net debt positions are not a bad thing necessarily. Uh, when you think about what assets and infrastructure you're building. Um, we do have several communities that we work with that, that are in what we call a net debt position. Try to work yourselves out of it, pay down the debt. Um, but it is a question of, uh, of you know, the right assets and the right infrastructure for the community to serve the community's needs. So that's the, oh, no, I, I wouldn't be afraid of a net debt position um, and it um, because it, it has to fit into the, the, the goals of the board and, and, um, and what the community wants. My my second question was uh, in your report, it, you've got some pretty standard language in there that says basically you haven't found any problems with the internal controls, etc. Do you know when the last time? And I I think your report says that you haven't specifically examined the internal controls, et cetera. Do you know when the last time that was done and when a reasonable time to do that is? I know you, you wouldn't do it every year, but how long has it been and when do you think it should be done again? Sure. Thank you, Director Doe. And maybe I'll I'll, I'll clarify, uh, you know, the first year that we worked with, with the region district, um, you know, as, as coming in with fresh eyes we took a really deep dive on some of those things to understand them and did that again this year um, as a result of a change in the in the audit standards instead of just focusing on key controls and higher level controls we were required this year to understand the processes uh, in your uh, finance department and and various other departments that would interface with finance uh, understand the processes better understand the IT and risks coming out of use of IT. So we did actually do a deeper dive this year. Um, and uh, you know, the, the positive out of that is I don't have an to report back to the board about that deeper dive this year that we were comfortable that risks are being managed. Again, we didn't specifically test effectiveness of controls, um, but we are comfortable that the controls are designed and implemented appropriately to manage the risk in, in the finance department. Great, thank you. If there are no other questions, then uh, I thank you for joining us as a delegation today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, going back to the agenda, we will move down to item what was item 14.1. At the Regional District 2022 Audited Financial Statements. We have a recommendation in front of us. We have a mover. It's the recommendation. Uh, and Director Paul. Thank you very much. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed? Motion carries. Great. All right, zip back up. Agenda. Uh, correspondence dated April 7th, 2023 from OC Sadmark. Stansky, Dover Stansky, that's it, annual fly in. Here, a um, motion has been submitted, so if we can move that to business arising. It's going straight to business arising. Okay. Do we have a motion that has been submitted? It's okay. coming up on the screen here, I believe. Yes, just one second. Here, thank you. Having mouse issues. It's very nice. There we go. The Catholic Regional District grant permission for the Texada annual fly-in to take place at CYGB July 31st, 2023. And then a letter be sent to the TAFI coordinator notifying him of this permission. 
We have a mover. I would like to move that. Okay, thanks very much. Oh, uh, second. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gisborne. Any discussion? Dr. Elliott. Just to a due diligence question to staff, are there implications from this decision for the regional district that we should be aware of before we make a decision? Yeah. Or Mr. Schwab? Uh, yeah, through the chair, we we have requirements that, that would be in place. They would have somebody sort of directing air traffic and a few other things, and they've been standard requirements over the years. Uh, obviously, I don't think there's, you know, that these have been on and off for the last few years, but I don't think we would have any real objections to something like this, and I, you know, our insurance would cover it. Okay, thanks very much. Any other discussion, questions, or comments? Chris Hall? I would just like to say that this event has been going on for years. It is a very big event after the uh, Aero Space Camp Children's Camp, and it's the big finale, and it's a very much look forward event on Texada. Okay, thank you. There are no other comments. We'll call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Great. Moving on to Chair's report. On March 27th and 28th, I attended the Regional District Chair and CAO Forum. Lots of interesting topics discussed over the two days. Uh, I got a chance to speak with Assistant Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, Tara Faganello, about um, local governments meeting with First Nations and the specifically the issue of open versus closed meetings. Uh, for those of you who are at the AVICC, you'll recall this came up there as well. She, of course, didn't have any answers for me at that point, but it's just nice to know that it's on everybody's radar and they are trying, they want to make sure that perceived roadblocks to communication are eliminated. We also heard an extremely impassioned presentation about indigenous perspectives on emergency management. Uh, the fires in Lytton were used as an example. And it was great to get the perspective uh, from indigenous leaders in the field of emergency management and learn how we as local governments can incorporate proper protocols into our emergency management plans. I was particularly pleased during this presentation because out of all of the RDs, got that regional district was the only one that was mentioned by name uh, as being a leader uh, at the leading edge of working with First Nations band on this issue. So another example of our staff keeping us ahead of the curve, I want to give them a uh, hands up. March 28th, 29th, Municipal Finance Authority Forum and AGM. Uh, there was a Municipal Finance Authority 101 introductory session just for all the newbies to let us know how it all works. And then they gave us the proper you know, statistics and how well MFA fared for 2022. Uh, the really interesting portion of the event was a talk given by a ge geopolitical analyst on the state of the world right now, taking such things as the war in Ukraine, energy supply and prices, and the mining of rare earth metals, and how those kind of things affect all of us. It's always pretty interesting when you dig deeper into an issue instead of just skimming the surface, and the real repercussions of our actions become more apparent. And uh on the 20 did i say march i didn't say march didn't i anyway sorry on april 28th i'll be attending the day of morning ceremony hosted by qp local 798. So moving on to director's report on the 12th i met with the stillwater community advisory group and we had a guest speaker luke clark from uh recreation sites and trails bc Give us an overview of some of the projects that are happening in our area and um, so that he would like to have more, I guess he'd like to have local representation of their ministry, which we do not have at this point, so that we can have more uh, collaboration between the ministry and local volunteer groups, of which there are quite a few. One of the common complaints from the local volunteer groups is that they seek permission to make improvements and build trails in the back country, but it takes so long to, uh, receive that permission that they lose enthusiasm. So hopefully that can be improved upon. The 14th to the 16th, um, many of us were at the Association of Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities Conference, uh, which is always a great time, network with colleagues and learn new stuff about what's going on. 
I'm just going to share one experience I had, and that was attending a session called Three Emerging Risks Affecting Every Local Government. It was uh, largely dealing with cyber threats, um, but it also uh, mentioned a few lawsuits that may have concerns about liability. Sandra Mayo from the Municipal Insurance Association was the presenter, and I thought she did a great job. I thought she was frank, knowledgeable, and entertaining as well, which is always a treat when you've got a presenter. And, and again, when I spoke to her afterwards about one of the lawsuits that she had mentioned and uh, how it could possibly have ramifications in our community, uh, she let me know that Patrick Devereaux from the Operations Department had already been speaking to her about it. So again, it's staff being out there, being proactive and, and you know trying to look out for our best interests. I want to mention Mr. Devereaux and the operations crew also. Just for fun this month, my son and I, uh, we visited all of the mainland beach access points just for something to do on Saturday mornings after we grabbed an egger. And uh, even though I consider myself pretty knowledgeable of the area, out of the 17 stops, I had only been to four of them in the last 22 years of living here. So they're all in great condition. I encourage others to get out there and check them out. The 17th, we had the Public River, uh, Powell River Public Library Trustees. Everything's going well. Uh, some of you already know there's $45 million included in the provincial budget for libraries, which is great, but I wish they would increase the regular spending for libraries so they can count on it. This is kind of a one-time shot. Um, another neat thing happening there is they're going to be subscribing to a thing called Press Reader where anybody with a library card can go onto the website or use the app and they can access over 5,000 newspapers from 100 countries. So even though the Vancouver Sun and the province no longer deliver to our area, we'll be able to access news from all over the world, which I think is kind of cool. Tonight I'll be attending a meeting of the Powell River Regional Cabinet Owners Association and I want to make notice that on May 13th, from noon till two o'clock, Lang Bay Hall is having their annual plant and craft sale. It's a great time. It's great for the community, all sorts of neat things and bargains. And if you get there on time, because everything goes fast. That's all I've got. Dr. Elliott, you wanna take over from there? Thank you, Mayor Brander. Um, so it's been a very busy time for me in the last few weeks. I did attend the housing um, conference that UBCM put on in Vancouver at the beginning of the uh, month. And I was able to meet with uh, several people there and talk about a variety of things. One of the things that caught my attention was um, this concept for uh, housing authorities and how they work differently in different areas. And so um, having learned from Lisa Helps, who's the former mayor of Victoria and now heading up a task force for the premier's office around housing, that there could be some real opportunities in that regard coming up very soon. Um, I started um, getting meetings, which I had some at ADICC and some at the housing with other municipal folks who have housing authorities. We organized um, one with the Whistler people and the mayor of uh, Seashelt joined us to talk about the model they're doing in Seashelt. We, um, Lee Bradner and myself also met with the uh, regional capital, regional district, and they talked about their model. And um, I learned about a few other models while I was at it. So I've gathered a lot of information around what kinds of models are out there. And I'm kind of interested in uh, figuring out how we uh, may consider those here within our area. Um, so I'm not quite sure where to go with that, but uh, I'll check with staff and other people as to what to do with all this information and how we consider it. Um, so that's been taking up my mind a little bit. Um, while I was at ADICC, I did attend the Vancouver Island Coastal Communities Climate Action um, workshop. Uh, we presented what we'd been doing in the last number of years and the reports that we'd had and how we were at the um, LGLA. We had all met in person and did a little bit of um, thinking around where we want to go take the steering committee and what, what our purpose could be moving forward. And it was clear that we wanted to move to more of a 
collaboration um, organization where we uh, facilitate the collaborations that are required for various regions to um, work together on their climate action initiatives. Rather than coming up with a big, huge area plan, um, which they, they tend to be outdated before you even get them, right? So some of the areas where collaboration could be um, really helpful is in mapping standards and uh, best practices, um, maybe better, uh, I had a comment in the uh, workshop section that I was facilitating, we broke, did breakout sessions. Um, and some of the folks that came to my session were from the lower Sunshine Coast and they were looking at for perhaps um, a way we could better collaborate between the lower and upper Sunshine Coast around storm surge mitigation and how that happens. Um, a way to share between various communities what the results of our um, flood plain mapping is and where we may see um, collaborating on what to do about that and being um, working together with other communities that have similar issues. Some, some areas have less capacity and don't want to duplicate and would like to borrow in order to get the best bang for their buck. So that's where, where we went with that session. That's going to come um, out in a report, you know, in a more of a document that shows what we learned in that session um, after our next meeting, which is in June. So, <laughs> Um, so that was well worth my while, and we did lots of stuff there. Um, well, I, I think I, I'm going to stop recording there because that's what's been taking up most of my brain power in the last little while. I've been very focused on housing and those kinds of things, and I am going to be starting to meet regularly with uh, the manager over at Vancouver Coastal Health around just communicating better in the community around issues that are attached to our hospital and Willingdon Creek and things like that. But that's more of a city thing, but the city is also in the regional district. So if people are interested in, in getting me information that they'd like me to talk to um, Vancouver Coastal Health about, they can definitely contact me and let me know what that is. I can raise those in those monthly check-ins that I'm gonna be having. Uh, first one starting in May 17th or 19th, I think, I, anyway. So upcoming soon. That's uh, great. Thanks very much. It's pretty exciting all the information you're getting about the housing. I, like you mentioned, I sat on that one session with you at the Capital Regional District, and it's. Uh, I'll be interested to see after you if you uh, compile all your research to see what you come up with. Yeah. Uh, Director Hollow. I do not have a director's report. Okay. At this time. All right. Thanks, Director Gisborne. Well, thank you, Chair. <laughs> it's been a uh, well, a very busy month. Let me get my notes up here so I don't miss anything. Okay, uh, let's see. March 28th was the Barber Rod and Gun Club's AGM, and I am once again the president of the Barber Rod and Gun Club. Um, no one else seemed to want to uh, <laughs> take the job. <laughs> so, uh, so there's lots of work going on there, and I'll circle back there. Um, of course, also April is planting and gardening season, so the farm has just been absolutely crazy trying to keep up with everything. Uh, the Fall Fair Committee met on April the 2nd. There's some new and exciting things coming forward, so just going to let the everyone know the date has been picked for September the 23rd and 24th, and that is starting the first day of fall for the Fall Fair. Uh, on April 11th, met with the Rod and Gun Club. Uh, there's a community event scheduled for June the 3rd, and that'll be from 12 until 5, and it is our first open house range day since 1998, so it's been a while. It will be a safe and responsible event, celebrating the history of the club, as well as educating the public on the responsible use of firearms at a legally approved location. As has been touched on, from 14th to 16th of uh, April, we had the ABICC convention. Another great event with lots of great networking opportunities. Um, one of the things that came up there that I had a bit of an internal conflict with uh, was I was invited to attend a dinner separate from the convention with the board and members of the Municipal Council. Uh, I would have loved to attend, but I also wanted to be at the ABICC banquet. Um, so I chose to attend the banquet rather than the dinner. I, it was not my intention to snub the relationship building or be obstinate or anything like that. Uh, I fully support gathering for dinner and stuff amongst our elected officials. I'd just like to do that locally. Uh, the uh, banquet actually got into some 
really good conversations about uh, ALR and housing and you know some of the uh, you know more senior members and so even some of the the staff people that were really busy at the convention they finally get a free chance during the banquet and next thing you know you get a couple of drinks in them and they actually start spilling the beans so <laughs> so I found that to be very uh, very productive um, the following week I attended the BC Wildlife Federation AGM on behalf of the Rotten Gun Club which was April 20th 21st and 22nd Lots of great work coming out of that organization in relation, in relation to science-based, data-driven wildlife policy. Uh, and something was brought to my attention that I find very troubling, and that has to do with the Lois Lake fish farm. It is drawing negative attention from around the province, and as you know, their leadership found out about where we're from, Pearl River, uh, they were bringing to our attention the uh, newspaper articles that are going all over Saanich and the Lower Mainland. Um, one of the newspapers has an item that said, quote, a January 17th, 2023 provincial inspection report revealed that the fish farm was pumping out 1.7 million kilos of trout a year, which is more than 1,100 times its license permits. Effluent coming off the farm also exceeded multiple limits, including high phosphorus concentrations. The reason I bring this up to the board is Area B and Area C official community plans have a policy in regards to regional potable water south of town. That is policy 2.4.2.6. Quote, the regional district will investigate the options and feasibility of developing a regional water supply system based on the conclusions and recommendations of the Southern Region Water Study completed by ACOM Canada Limited and the above study noted on quality and quality of groundwater resources. That study that's referenced in the OCP identifies Lois Lake as one of the ideal sources of potable water for, south, for our south of town region. This recent news of potentially significant increased pollution into a planned water source makes me think we should take action to find out more because just reading newspaper articles, I don't think it's enough for us to act on. Uh, therefore, I will be putting forward a motion into the May Committee of the Whole meeting, and I'm just giving the board notice right now about such a motion. I don't have the wording of it, but it will be, in essence, to get a copy of the January 17th, uh, 2023 Provincial Inspection Report and inquire to the appropriate bodies regarding impacts of water quality in the Lois Lake area. And uh, I think that ends my report. I'm still recovering from doing two conventions and just <laughs> going very fast. Hey, okay, thanks very much. Yeah, it sounds like you had a busy month that mm -hmm. uh, we were speaking prior to the meeting about your wildlife convention. It sounded quite interesting. Oh, and I missed one thing, sorry. Sure, go ahead. Um, at the BC Wildlife Federation, I found out something very interesting about our community. Our province is broken up into, I think, 10 or 12 wildlife management regions and each wildlife management region then has communities that are participants and members for you know what kind of wildlife is going on we're part of region two lower mainland's part of region two vancouver island is region one so each community gets one ability like one region to essentially advocate for wildlife management Powell river is the exception we actually get governance through region one and we also get management through region two. So we're the only community in the whole province where we can actually get the benefit of two regions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's a, a little unique thing about our neck of the woods. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, Director Fall. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, end of March, I had a meeting of the Vancouver Island Regional Library. Uh, nothing uh, really big that I'm able to report on there, but things move along. Uh, last weekend, the Laskiti Island Nature Conservancy held their AGM that I attended. They had a very good uh, workshop on uh, amphibians, presentation from an amphibian expert, and a hike on the Johnny Osland uh, Nature Reserve, which was donated uh, several years ago by Johnny Osland to the Islands Trust Conservancy. So it's a very nice uh, quarter section he donated. So on his passing, which was nice. Uh, ABICC, as others have reported on, it was uh, very interesting, and I'll, I'll have a few items that I'd like to bring up and a couple of directors have already raised a few. First, the, the resolution submitted jointly by the QRD and the city asking the province to restore funding to libraries was endorsed unanimously um, at, the, at the convention, which is great. Uh, we'll see whether the province listens or not. They did the one-time funding as the chair reported, but uh, 
you know, they, they ideally, and, and the Vancouver Island Regional Library concurs with this, uh, we're communicating the same thing that, you know, the, the funding has, provincial funding has just declined over the years and just needs to come back up if we want to take libraries, uh, have their role in the community. The, the session on libraries, I didn't attend all of it, but I, I attended part of it. And it had a very good discussion regarding the role of libraries in general, but I thought the discussion about the role libraries may have to help build capacity for people to reduce risk dis disinformation. I thought that was a very interesting discussion that occurred during that because there is a, a role for libraries, both for literacy, but also helping people build, build up uh, critical thinking. So I was glad to see uh, some discussion on that. The session on risk management that uh, Chair Brander mentioned uh, was really yeah. interesting. It focused on, you know, information <clears throat> technology risk management and cybersecurity. And, and just to add to what uh, the chair mentioned, the, the the presenter was very good. And one of the uh, maybe items that might come out of it is, is sharing stories. We saw that in other aspects of AVICC in other sessions, but being able to share stories, not just of um, of losses. So, so what have ha what has happened to local government in terms of cyber risk, uh, so that others can learn. But also, what are the solutions? So, being able to put together information, maybe through UBCM, of here's a bunch of stories of problems. Here's how they recovered. Here's how the local government recovered. Here's how much it costs. One of the and and then here's some solutions to 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 deal with it. One of the items that uh, the presenter raised was the, the you know what you know question came up of why is insurance for cybersecurity so high? And the answer is quite simple because the costs are very high. So the, you know, the, the immediate cost of losing data isn't, is only part of it. The co long-term costs of recovery, lost operations, getting data back, and then maybe even, you know, legal issues and loss of private information and so on. There's the costs can mount up pretty quickly and hence insurance costs are high. The, I also went to the Vancouver Island Coastal Community Coastal Climate Leadership uh, planning session that uh, Director Elliott mentioned. The the presentation focused on collaborative shoreline risk mapping, and I thought it was very nicely done because these two neighboring local governments are comparing their methods, doing like we did. We did our shoreline risk mapping, flood risk mapping, but they they're collaborating and, and trying to share information on on standards and how to how to get maps that that can be combined and so on. So I think that that collaboration, the collaborative aspect, is very important. The session there was a session on changes to the emergency program act that that will affect us and and they're they're starting to come online this year the province is doing this in two phases they're giving us the carrot and then following up with the stick so they're starting with aspects that enable local governments with with new authorities to manage emergencies so they're they're gonna that those are rolled out they might even already be out and that will be giving extra tools for the regional district during emergencies, which would be good. And then over time, they will follow this with new requirements. And there's a number of new requirements that, uh, you know, and questions around that. And they may be things that need to be done and they may be important to do, but they may also have some cost implications. Uh, and I think as those roll out, I think we might want to consider for some of for some of the planning and reporting that might need to be done we may be able to collaborate with Sunshine Coast Regional District as one neighboring government that might reduce some of the costs I was talking with uh, Donna McMahon about that and uh, uh, during the session and, and there may be some ways that we might be able to collaborate because there will be some uh, I wouldn't call it downloading just extra requirements for local governments that will that regional districts will need to do to make sure that we are ready and for emergencies and better plan. And finally, the reconciliation session, which was towards the end, was uh, really excellent. I thought the, the panel was good and I really liked the uh, the statement, uh, the, I guess the phrase by uh, John Jack, the chair of the uh, Alberni Cleoquot Regional District, which is more than halfway and more than half the time. So I think that, you know, that we reaching out, if we want to do reconciliation, we need to really do a reach and, uh, and and it needs to be done uh, really explicitly with with some effort. And I think we're doing we're doing pretty, very well. I think our regional district is ahead of the curve a bit there, but we can always do more. So I thought that was uh, really uh, insightful. And with that, I will end. Thank you, Chair. Great. Thanks, Director Fall. Um, I also attended that uh, session about libraries. I just wanted to make notice or uh, bring the attention to that Rebecca Burbank, our local head librarian, was one of the presenters. I thought she did a fantastic job.
Dr. Adamson. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I have a report that um, Director Lennox uh, emailed me, so, so I'm just going to read that off for you. Sure. Um, he attended the AVICC convention also with the other directors in the CAO and said that there was many interesting topics to digest and participate in. He particularly, um, the session on legislative reform stood out for him and a clear need to reassess the Local Government Act and its restrictions on opportunities for better governance and participation in decision making. Many topics that are explored are being addressed by the um, regional district already. Codes of conduct, IT security, coastal flood mapping are a few, and it instilled confidence in him that they're tackling them in an organized and forward-looking manner. Networking with other elected officials and staff is always informative, and it opens one's mind to opportunities and potential solutions or ideas. Uh, they're also solidifying the relationships as a board when we meet and spend time together like this with all you folks. Um, attended the Land Waterworks uh, District in, uh, Improvement Advisory Committee and caught up with the latest information on options available to upgrade the system and the costing objectives. The AGM is on Thursday, that's tomorrow, April 27th at 4.30 p.m. Um, at the North Center um, in Lund. He recommends that all Lund Water users attend this meeting and anybody else who's interested in what's happening with the Lund Water situation. He's fielded several calls with several uh, with Savory Island folks, including the Silk Group and the ASIC, and others that are interested in the upcoming OCP review. ACIC is working on a visitor advisory committee that has been created to explore um, the following topic. The topic is to understand the impacts of increased usage of Savory Island and to identify opportunities to balance the needs of residents, visitors, and environment. SILT is working on getting information to savory residents and visitors on sustainability and what it means uh, to this island. He wanted to comment that those groups really love and care about the island and are working hard for it. Um, he's had mostly positive feedback from residents on savory after finally getting the grader and the compactor over to the island to compete the repairs to the roadways. And he said some calls regarding the upcoming referendum um, on the upgrades to the North Center um, uh, Resource Center and the QRD website has great information for everybody to place their votes. And I noticed when I came in today, it's a pre-voting day for that event today. So uh, the final voting day is May 6th for that North Center uh, vote. And um, he said he looks forward to getting home and seeing you all when he's back away from work. Oh, great. We miss him. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, legislative reform, that, as you mentioned, that came out at the AVICC. It also came up at the Regional District Chairs and CAOs Forum. So I'm glad to see there's a crew working on that. And uh, I imagine Saver is very happy with the greater and the compactor. I work it out. Yeah, busy month. I'm just going to mix up all the various things I went to because they all work towards being together in local government. So. On the 24th, 25th, and 26th of March, seems like years ago now, I attended the Columbia Institute High Ground Seminar, and the title of that was Home. And basically, they were looking at housing, health, uh, well being in communities across the province and talking about those issues. Uh, high on the agenda was reconciliation and UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and how all of those things work together. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into that, but housing was a very high point in that, and working together on housing and trying to find ways to provide some kind of affordable and attainable housing for everybody in our communities. We had a city strategy session on the 30th and the 31st, April. I attended a Cassette Community Justice Forum on April the 1st to see about the kind of work they do and how they do their work uh, trying to resolve community issues. And uh, the next thing I went to was Cassette Pride, which had an annual general meeting on the 12th. And I attended that both as a city representative and a regional district representative. They were talking about their plans for celebrating Pride and trying to make decisions on whether to do it basically with most of the other communities in the province in June or July, or whether to have a entirely separate day for the Cassette region in August. Part of, part of their decision making on that is going to depend on grant application they have with the Powell River Regional District, the Cassette Regional District, and when, uh, when they 
would receive grant money if they receive it. And that's something we'll be talking about, I guess, when we talk about our looking at our grant applications for this year. I went uh, along with everybody else uh, on the board and the city board to the AVICC convention. Again, the legislative reform you know, was a high point on mine. Basically, the discussion with uh, First Nations groups, I learned some, some different language. One of the things that First Nations people were pointing out was that, simple statement, they have rights. And as local governments, we don't particularly have rights. We have duties, we have responsibilities. The First Nations actually have rights. They don't ask us for them, they have them. And I think it's uh, something we need to think about is trying to get it integrated. A big part of AVICC and the high ground uh, program was to try to get the integration of First Nations governments or participation at least in different kinds of ways in regional district boards. It's legal to do it. There is some ability for First Nations that have treaties to participate, but there are a number of barriers that make it difficult. But uh, the discussion was around opening opening up and sharing and consulting more and discussing more about how we can work together. Uh, the city had a George Cuff seminar uh, where we had a consultant come in and talk about uh, board procedures and council procedures and everything. It was very valuable. We've got the books here. And uh, certainly a person that's worth listening to and uh, reading ideas. So uh, that's it. I, I want to also talk about housing authorities because that's uh, that's something I participated with Councillor Elliott and Director Brander uh, on in a discussion with the Capital Regional District people about housing authorities. And I think there are opportunities. Really, what we're talking about, if we're talking about a joint housing authority with the regional district and the city, is some kind of a regional service uh, that could be provided. Other regional districts do that. We talk to people from Seashell, from from the Capital Regional District, from Whistler, and they all have different models about how to provide a housing authority for the communities they live in. Each one has its own specific design for design for their area and for what they need and how the area is comprised. So. I think that's something we need to look at, something we need to consider if we're going to actually make some progress on affordable and attainable housing in all our communities. So uh, that's it. It was a full month. There's, uh, I think, only about three days when I have a blank spot on my calendar where there wasn't municipal or regional district meeting. But, but uh, basically, all of these things, you know, create enthusiasm for the projects we're doing. I had opportunities to at all of these to talk to people from other health districts, other regional hospital districts, and about the issues they're facing with Vancouver Coastal Health or Island Health. Uh, one of the things at AVICC was a report, a report on what Island Health is doing to create healthy communities. And uh, the interesting process, they have funding from Island Health that goes to creating coalitions within communities on Vancouver Island. And uh, maybe it's something we can talk to Vancouver Coastal Health about in the future. But my two best friends. Great, thanks very much. I'm really glad that uh, you and Director Elliott are both gathering so much information on housing authorities and different models out there. Hopefully we can come up with something that'll work locally. Director Elliott. Thank you, Chair. Um, I neglected to mention um, one piece of, in my report and um, I, I attended a community action team on Monday of this week, and it's the first one we've had since uh, 2022, I believe. So, like we've, they've been postponed, and they had some transition in staffing, and so they 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 had canceled one or two of them. Anyway, so one of the things that was presented was some statistics around opioid um, use in our in our region and how it's working out this year so far and it all rolls up to um, deaths uh, uh, for opioids in Tibet are about 4.81 per 100,000 which is incredibly high it, uh, it's one of the highest in the province and um, so that isn't good and 
The positive I took away though was uh, we do have access to a machine that does testing. It's about a sixty-five thousand dollar machine, and we have that in our region now. And so there's um, right now it's working in the Kahaman area, and it's going to be branching out and doing some days over at our local CRC. And we, as a result of that machine, we were able to get a an alert out and information out in our region around um, this new tranquilizer thing that was hitting the streets earlier than we would have been able to without it and probably saved a bunch of lives recently. So that was one positive thing that we've worked really hard to get this machine and we now have it. And um, we're hope we're hopeful that it will make a difference out there. Um, so I, I did attend that on Monday as well. And I wanted just to report out on that. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it. So, we are on to the consent agenda now. Uh, and now is the opportunity for anybody to take anything out of the consent agenda that they would like to debate and discuss. Seeing no hands, do I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda? Director Gisborne, thank you. Seconded by Dr. Hollow. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed? Motion carried. So, moving down the agenda to item 11, there are nothing removed, so we're on to 12.1. Subdivision application district lot 5248, 2732, Zelensky Road, Electoral Area C. And we have a recommendation. Would somebody like to move the recommendation? I'll move the recommendation. We're in a second. Dr. Elliott, thank you very much. Any discussion? Dr. Gisborne. Uh, thank you, Chair. I see we have two alternate directors here today. This is an item from the Planning Committee, uh, which uh, Planning Committee items are four directors, A, B, C, and D. Um, the reason this one's not on the consent agenda is I opposed it at the Planning Committee meeting. And the reason I oppose it still is our official community plans are fairly comprehensive documents based on public input. The official community plan states the minimum lot size. The application is below the minimum lot size and it's also below the average lot size of what's outlined in the official community plan. Outside the city limits in our electoral areas, we have a couple of areas where we have regulatory zoning bylaws, but most of the area we don't. What we use to guide you know, development essentially is just the official community plan and residents and community members working with each other to kind of go, hey, this is our, our guideline. And while we don't enforce the official community plan outside of the zone bylaws, we do use it as recommendation. And as a result, we want the public to respect the OCP and the policies. And I think that starts at the board. The OCP sets minimum lot size for public input. And with this application, it's below the minimum lot size. It's outside of what the OCP lays out. So I'm going to stand with the OCP and I'm going to vote against this. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Any other discussion? I'm just going to put my two bits in on this one. Um, yes, Director Gisborne is correct. The OCP stipulates minimum lot sizes, average lot sizes. It is slightly below the average lot size. Um, it is a little bit further below the minimum lot size. Um, but this is the OCP and those regulations within the OCP or, or uh, guidelines, I guess, within the OCP are not exclusively the only things we go by and they're not hard and fast. And in some cases you take the lay of the land or natural boundaries uh, in order to make the lot lines. And that's what the planning department has come forward with us today. They've taken advantage of a treat area and a drainage ditch. And so these are just kind of the natural way to divide this property. They've also looked at the parcel sizes in the neighborhood and having a minimum lot size of, I believe it's one acre or an acre or hectare, I'd have to look back, but falls into that range of lot sizes that are up and down Zelensky Road. So 
I personally don't see a problem with this. And also the, the minimum lot sizes still fall into line with uh, regulations that uh, Vancouver Coastal Health has for minimum lot sizes. So I'll be supporting this recommendation. Any other comments? Director Gisborne. Yeah, um, let me just, where is it? I'm trying to find it on here. Yeah, it's a, a minimum parcel size is 1.4 hectares within the official community plan bylaw, a four point, uh, sorry, 467, 2.3.1.2, average parcel size of two hectares. This one, the average, Parcel size is 1.95, so that one's not much of a sticking point for myself. However, the minimum parcel size is, I don't know which one, average, it's in here somewhere. I think it's what, one? One, one hectare. One hectare, which is, you know, going from 1.4 to one, that's not, a, that's not a small difference. And one of the reasons why the members of the public would prefer larger parcel sizes when you're looking at rural residential land because rural residential land allows a lot of unpleasant uses and as most of us know in rural areas when you have an unpleasant use going on having a larger parcel size usually allows the property owners to kind of have a bit better setbacks and, and be able to kind of work it out amongst themselves what we usually see is when you get smaller parcels you tend to have more land use conflicts and therefore the OCP would tend to recommend that uh, you know, have fewer conflicting uses. So, you know, if we want the public to, to respect our OCP, I think we need to respect the OCP first. So um, if they want to subdivide their land, I would support a 1.4 hectare subdivision, not a one hectare subdivision when the OCP says 1.4. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Any other comments? Seeing none, all in favor of the recommendation? Any opposed? One opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we are moving on to item 12.2. Community works funds. We have a motion that the board, a recommendation that the board direct staff for a report regarding including electoral areas in the allocation of community works funds and options for such allocations. Uh, Director McCormick had brought that forward. She's not here today. Do we have somebody else that would like to move the motion? Motion. Follow. Seconded by oh, Director Fall. Thank you very much. Any discussion? Director Gisborne? Yeah, um, another one of those motions that's not in the consent agenda because I was opposing it. Uh, community works funds, I absolutely support including the electoral areas as like the core value of our community works funds because we get funding for the electoral area residents. That's kind of the whole purpose of regional district community works funds. Um, the reason why I oppose it, this motion, is because we already have a report from last June. It covers most of the uh, most of the topics about community works funds and other regional districts. And I don't support asking staff to write another report when really we can just get that that previous report from June to come before us, and then we can provide clear direction to our staff for amending the policy. Uh, it's probably not a lot of work for staff to just bring up the old report and then maybe offer a few changes. Uh, but myself, I, I, we made a motion back in March that we get that report from June at the upcoming Finance Committee, but we haven't had that report come before us yet. So I'd be happy to postpone this item until we do get the June 2022 report. And then we can have a more in-depth conversation about it and then give clear direction to our staff and just save everyone's time. Okay, thank you very much. Any other comments, Director Bell? Yeah, I'm not, not of a mind to oppose this right now is all it's doing is asking for a report. It doesn't mean that I might be happy to see the recommendations or directions that come to the board. I'll reserve my right to comment on what those directions might be or recommendations, if there are any, when they come. Otherwise, uh, I'm happy to see a report. But I think uh, 
overall we need to think about at the board what is in the interest of the greater good of all of the residents of the regional district and uh, what's fair. Okay, thank you, Director Elliott. Thank you, Chair. Um, two things. One, is anyone else noticing a chemical smell in here? No? no. Okay, it's just me. <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it smells, smells a bit like a felt pen or something, and it's giving me a bit of a headache, but I don't, I don't know if it's me. It's, but the other thing is, is that I, I kind of would like to see the report from last June. I wasn't part of the board then. I don't know what that report says or or how that's different than this report. And it does make sense to me that we revisit the report that we already have and then maybe decide from there if we want staff to bring us back more recommendations or different options or look into something that maybe isn't already in the report. So um, process-wise, I think uh, it would be great to see what we already have before we ask for something else. Um, that's just what I think. Okay, thank you, Director Hollow. Or sorry, Director Adamson first, and then Director Hall. And I, I think Linda Greenan had a comment. Okay, if I'm going to interrupt you for a moment and let Ms. Greenan speak. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that um, I knew that this resolution was coming forward and I have drafted a report um, and it does have uh, more information. I got more um, more responses from other regional districts between June 2022 when the first report was written and um, when this report was drafted. So uh, just want to make you aware that the report is already drafted um, in case this resolution is passed. Okay, thanks very much. Well, that's good information to have. Director Anderson. Uh, through the chair, um, I wasn't at these meetings when this was discussed, but I have actually watched all of the videos of, of the discussion and, and read the notes. And my understanding, and, and um, uh, thank you, Ms. Green, and that, that the report's written already anyway, I, I'm always an advocate of more information as makes for better decisions. And my understanding from um, Director McCormick was that she just wanted to augment last June's report by adding the details regarding the electoral areas that was not, in her opinion, really articulated in the last report. It was more about community work fund allocations generally. So I was pre coming prepared to vote in favor of this resolution just to say, use the old report, augment it, and then present it. And it sounds like it's pretty much ready to go. Perfect. Uh, Director Hollow? I withdraw my comment. Okay. Any other comment, Director Gisborne? Oh, uh, Director Paul first, you've had a comment already. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to draw attention for, for directors who were not uh, on the board last term. The That report from the is on the June 30th, uh, 2022 regional board agenda, and it's on a publicly available site. So just for directors to go read the report, do not we don't need to ask staff to bring it forward. It is forward, it's in the public domain. And that report, we, we uh, looked at the report and we at the time decided to make no changes. And so as uh, our manager of financial services just said, the, the well, two things. One is there's more information to build on the report and the report's already pretty much, uh, there's already a, a, a report mostly done or maybe completely done. So I think we're, you know, staff has heard the discussion, the that report from last June or from June, 2022, last June, will be part of that i'm quite sure it'll be referred to it it is available and the direction has been given to bring forward options and then we can have that discussion as director doubt and others have mentioned once we have that old report the previous report and uh new information that's already been assembled then the board can roll up its sleeves um on and and, and look through the options and decide how we want to do this i think it's really important for us to clarify this this issue keeps coming up in you know the, since I was elected uh, two terms ago or 2018 and I think we really need to wrap our minds around it so that we can use those funds efficiently and cohesively and uh, use them for for uh, bringing us together and not uh, and not you know in ways that that cause uh, some sort of difference you know too many differences of opinion between the board I think we want to use them efficiently to do what's best for the regional district as a whole taking into consideration where the funds come from and, and what they're, the province intends them for. All those things. Thank you, Chair. And Director Gisborne. Thank you. Um, 
I'm surprised to hear the comments from Director Fall that we don't need to ask for that report to come forward because we just adopted the minutes of our last board meeting, which reads 10.5 that the board directs staff to bring forward the report dated June 22nd, 2022, Community Works Funds Allocation Policy 3.12 to a future finance committee agenda. So we've already asked for that report to come before us. So I'm kind of surprised to hear now that, well, we don't need to ask staff bring forward the old report because we already asked staff to bring forward the old report through resolution that's that's what i'm talking about but hearing from our staff that they've already essentially gone forward and written the report or mostly written the report then i guess postponing this resolution till next month until we can get the june 22nd report Makes doesn't make any sense because like the report's already written so I withdraw my opposition and I will vote in favor of it because. Great, so if there are no other comments, we'll call the question, all in favor? Any opposed, none opposed, motion carries. Moving on to bylaws, Resource Recovery Center and Waste Transfer Station Loan Authorization Bylaw number 587, comma 2023. We vote. We have a recommendation. Uh, I have a mover. Director Doubt. Uh, seconded by Director Elliott. Thank you. Any discussion? None. All in favor? Any opposed? Unopposed? Motion carries. Next motion that the board give third reading. Director Doubt. Thank you very much. Seconded, Director Gisborne. Any discussion, Director Gisborne? Yeah, I have a question. Um, and maybe the corporate officer can help me. Because uh, this is a bylaw. Do we need to read out the bylaws when we do move? No. So our procedure bylaw does touch this. It doesn't actually specifically say that it must be um, read out. It just that it be given. So uh, I'll double check right now if you guys have a moment. Sure. Yeah, because I I I don't want us to. You know, take on a big loan and then someone have us, yeah. you know, over a barrel, barrel over a technicality. And if, if it just requires maybe reading out the previous motion, because I was just thinking, I was like, wait, I remember reading out bylaws. <laughs> it's always That's usually the practice, you're right. We can go back and read out the first one if you want. Okay. Just want to make sure our I's are dotted and T's are crossed when we're talking about big money. <laughs> Okay, uh, yes, so section 5.4, the readings and adoption of the bylaw shall be by resolution stating the bylaw title and purpose. So, okay. um, so we should go back to 13.11? Yep. Okay. Back it out. Without any comment, I'll just move that the board get first and second reading of, re of Resource Recovery Center and Waste Transfer Station Loan Authorization Bylaw, number 587-2023. We already have a seconder for that? Yep. Have, okay. Um, any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Any opposed? Any opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to number two. Director Doubt. That the board give third reading of Resource Recovery Center and Waste Transfer Station Loan Authorization Bylaw Number 587-2023. That was seconded by Director Gisborne. Is that right? Okay. Great. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Good catch, Director Gisborne. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, moving on to reports. Oh, with 14.1, we already did that. No new business. Question period. Mr. Galinsky on. Uh, thank you, Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to ask a question. With regard to the just concluded item, item 13.1, I'm wondering when final reading of the uh, bylaw will occur. Uh, sir? Uh, thank you for the chair. Uh, we will forward this on for approval of the Inspector of Municipalities. That usually takes uh, approximately six weeks, and then it will be brought back to the board for consideration. I appreciate the corporate officer's response, Chair. Thank you very much. That was my question. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, there's nobody else in the gallery. I don't think there's anybody online asking questions. But we have now reached our in-camera session. Oh, if I can get somebody to read that whole thing out. Okay. 
I move that the board move in camera that the meeting be closed to the public on the grounds that the subject matter to be considered relates to matters covered by the community charter under section 91C, labor relations or other employee relations, G, litigation or other potential litigation affecting the regional district, I, the receipt of advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, K, negotiations and related discussions respecting the proposed provision of a regional district service that are other preliminary stages and that in the view of the board could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the regional district it's being held in public uh, l discussions with regional district officers and employees respecting regional district objectives measures and progress reports for the purposes of preparing an annual report under section 98 and regional district report and in the consideration of whether a board meeting should be closed under a provision of this subsection or subsection two. thank you very much uh, seconded by any discussion all in favor any opposed? Not opposed. Motion carries. We're going in camera.
Okay, Chair, we're back in open session. Okay, thanks. We're back in open session and we have a rise report. Uh, I'd like to report that the board rise report of the following. The board received a correspondence dated March 6, 2023 from Ezra Auerbach regarding the accountability of the Laskidi Island Volunteer Fire Department. The board sent a letter to Stefan Wolfson at City West in December 2022, expressing support for their application to Connected Communities BC. Number three, the Catholic Regional District adopted the proposed Laskidi Island Emergency Dispatch Policy. Number four, the board will consider the first quarter strategic plan progress report at the next operationally practical open committee of the whole meeting. And number five, the board is terminating the organics processing facility request for proposal process, including any associated agreement negotiations. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Goodbye. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Enjoy the sun.